Welcome to the Innovation and Compliance Podcast, part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Join us every week as we talk with industry innovators who are making compliance to help business run more efficiently and at the end of the day, more profitably. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And today I'm extraordinarily pleased to have with me E.J. Marin. E.J. is the Director of Solution Engineering at Nikisa, and he is going to visit with us today about a topic that doesn't get enough play in the compliance community, but is not only extraordinarily important, but I'm going to suggest to you is much more important in the era of COVID-19 and will be going forward. So, EJ, first of all, with that incredibly long-winded introduction, welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. Oh, thank you, Tom. I'm thrilled to be here. EJ, I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of your professional background leading up into your current role. Yeah, so I started my professional life 20 plus years ago in the IT space, especially with focus on HR technologies. So I grew up in the on-premise world. At that stage, there was no cloud. And I experienced the rise of hybrid world between the on-premise and the cloud. And now I'm focusing on, you know, the latest HR digital transformation, especially happening in the cloud. But we still see hybrid landscapes or hybrid solutions transition between the on-premise to the cloud and so on. So in a nutshell, I'm I'm a techie who loves to help the HR function. That's what I am. I have a cute phrase I use, which is something along the lines of, I need to get your people to talk to my people. (laughs) And because I would say that a techie who could help both HR and compliance is something we definitely need to talk more about. So I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about what you do at Nikisa, and perhaps you could start off with what's your role as Director of Solution Engineering? Yeah, my role is to talk to customers. The beauty of engineering solution is that you get to see customer challenges, you know, from different angles. Then I I can identify patterns, sometimes evidence, sometimes hidden patterns. Then we can engineer solutions that can be consumed by the majority of the HR professionals. So that's what we do. We engineer solutions for the HR function, for the HR professional. So how do you define organizational design? Organizational design, I think, has been challenged lately. I think from the classic point of view, organizational design was all about the org chart, how people are organized, functions, how functions support the business and the business units and so on. But right now, organizational design is more about agility is more about resilience. Due to COVID and, and everything that's happening, organizational design for me, it's now it's all about adapting to the next normal, not to the new normal, but to the next things that are coming that people are trying to predict somehow, some way. That's what organizational design is today. That includes HR data, includes talent data, includes business objectives, and so on, so on, so on. So it's all about analytics, analyzing the organization and making sure that at the end of the day, you're adapting to the situation as fast as possible. Jay, one of my observations about the COVID-19 health crisis has been that trends that may have started multiple years back or even 2018, 2019, have accelerated almost exponentially because of COVID-19. Would that be fair in your world as well? Absolutely. Yeah. So things that were optional before, things that we've been talking about maybe for 10 10 years, five years, like, for example, talent analytics or design, the same thing. Now, these things are not optional anymore. This is the way you play the game. You have to have those capabilities and and those skills to survive in this environment. What we see today is that organizations are drowning in Excel spreadsheets, and that's not sustainable. You know, the speed of change that we are suffering due to COVID cannot be sustained with the spreadsheets and, and Excels here and there. Transformation needs to become a routine or reorganization needs to become a routine. Uh, that's how one of our customers put it. And they want to get to that stage. Without getting your hair on fire every time you get a request from leadership, you need to create these capabilities in your organization so you can easily reply and respond and adapt to these new challenges that we have in the marketplace today. EJ, do you find that traditional HR departments are set up for that type of adaptation, that type of of really transformation ability or even resilience, or is that something they're they're having to think through as a basic change? They're having to adapt very quickly. So they're having to think about these things. They're trying to change their clothes while they're walking. So if they were not there, 
because of whatever reason, now they are push force to be more strategic, to be more analytical, to make decisions data driven and so on. So that's the part that I see changing for everybody in the marketplace. It doesn't matter the size of the company, it doesn't matter who you are, what are you doing. The HR professional right now is completely challenged to behave in a different way. One of the things that struck me in researching you and Akisa for this podcast was get a way to think through organizational design. And I was wondering if you could just sort of walk us through the steps that you might counsel a customer with and, and explain a little bit of each one of those. Yeah, or design normally goes through a first part, I would say three steps, three main steps. The first one is about assessing the current organization, right? So normally what happens is the HR function is requested to show the organization, the org chart, for lack of a better term, to the leadership. So they find out just looking at the org chart that things could change, things could improve, maybe reduction in force, maybe mergers of departments or whatever is the case. So the assessment of, of the organization is the first step. The second step is about creating objectives. Okay, what is what we're trying to achieve here? Is this about reduction in force? Okay, how much is the budget needs to be reduced? What are the financial targets? What are the HR targets? Like, I need to keep the talent. So we know for experience that every time there is a reorganization, the top talents leave the organization because they start to perceive that there are problems with the organization. So how do we protect that? So the HR dimension, and then of course, the business dimension to the things of how do we keep the operation going? How do we make sure that if you have a work, workers council, how do you consider those things if you have unions? So that's the second step, all about creating the objectives. The third step is about all collaboration. So you start moving the org charts. In the case of Hanley, you move the org charts, you move, you see the impact immediately on, on the KPIs, on, on the metrics of the organization. So you can track that if you're getting closer or further away from those objectives. And these collaborations happen in online, in this platform. So everybody's seeing the effect of every decision all the time. And then you can document that and, and all that. So that's how you get to realize. And then the fourth stage is about making those changes into your core HR system. So making those things happen at the end. So how these things are going to look into your core HR system that will affect your payroll, will affect your budget, will affect your finance, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the whole process how it normally goes and handling in this case helps to streamline that with technology. That's what we do. Jay, it seems to me one of the themes you've already talked about throughout this podcast is data, use of data, analysis of data. I was wondering if you might give us your thoughts on what is HR data quality and why does that matter? Yeah, HR data, it's a life. It's by definition, right? Because you have all your higher to retire processes touching the data in a day-to-day -day basis. So it is very easy to get out of sync. And your core HR system, their main focus, of course, is, is the financial aspect, right? Payroll, budgeting, and, and headcount planning and all that. But since you have your higher to retire going on all the time, it's very easy to get out of sync. So tracking your organizational data and your employee data it's important so you know, you can explain why the data is, is in a certain way. You can see if this is really a data integrity issue or this is a temporary stage of your data while you get to the final stage on your organization, right? You could have like, for example, isolated departments because you lost the manager of that department. You're waiting for that to happen. So you have to have visibility on all of these, especially when you're basing your decisions on data when you have data-driven decision-making processes, you have to consider all these dimensions to the nature of the HR data and making sure that you are following up and uh, you're getting better somehow, that you're tracking these things and making sure that the data, the gaps are closed and that you can explain that because the, the first challenge that HR has is that when they show the data to a leader, that is not in the HR phase, it's very easy to push back and say, that's not true, or this is not my organization, or this is not what I'm seeing. So you have to have a strong foundation to document and explain why this data is true, why this is, this is not wrong, and so on. So otherwise, you will lose credibility, and it is important to keep the data in check. And again, making sure that you're getting closer to better quality and not away from it. 
EJ, one of the most difficult undertakings for any business is the reorganization or merger during a, uh, or what would come about from an acquisition. And I was wondering if now, if I threw in an overlay of diversity and inclusion, what are the three steps to having better diversity and inclusion in the M&A setting? Yeah, so that's a very important challenge. It's not only in the M&A, but due to COVID, all these reorganizations going on at, at the time, diversity and inclusion, we know, is a business asset. So all the research proved that this is something that organizations, when they achieve diversity and inclusion, they perform better, this better business, better profitability, and so on. So it is a business asset. So going through transformation and an M&A, like, for example, the example that you put, you want to keep that asset, right? You want to keep that part of the culture that you gained and making sure that those are values and competencies that you don't lose through any reorganization, merchant acquisition, or, or whatever. But I would say the first stage is, again, it's all about assessment, having the data, so where you are, where you're at at the moment, and where you want to go. So second step, having those objectives. So in the French Equality Index that we are developing, there is a law at least to track the pay gap and making sure that those things, as you change your organization, as you merge them, that you are still under compliance and that you are not going to, you know, making bigger the gap on at least on pay equality, for example. And the third step is to execute. The third step is, okay, how to implement programs, recruiting different aspects of management day-to-day life that needs to be changed so you know that you are closing those gaps again. Once you identify those gaps, that you're closing them, that you're getting better, that, again, you are having a positive effect on the business and making sure that that asset or that capability, which is diversity and inclusion, is is well kept in the organization. Jay, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time, but I was wondering if our listeners wanted any additional information, where could they go? Oh, they can visit nakisa.com. That's where we you can see or our Hanley solution, which is all about organizational transformation. And my my email, ej.marine at nakisa.com, you can always throw an email and we can start a conversation. Well, EJ, I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to visit with me today. Thank you, Tom. If you want to stay up to date on the latest innovations in compliance and help your business run more efficiently, subscribe to this podcast and help spread the word by leaving a review.